sad. Okay, so we're moving on to our next story. This story was something that I never ever considered. I didn't think it was a real thing. Platinum P on YouTube commented on, I believe it was on my Bigfoot episode yesterday, said, why don't you cover Mormon Bigfoot? And I responded, because I'd never heard of it before, and I will look into it. So I spent this morning looking into, and assuming, I'm going to find nothing. No offense, Platinum P. I, I figured that it was a real thing that you had heard about, but I figured it would be totally obscure. There are a ton of resources on Mormon Bigfoot. Now, this is what's interesting. It's not that Bigfoot himself is Mormon. It's the Mormon's theory on Bigfoot. So we're going to have to go back in time to start this story off. We're going to go back to late 1800s. David W. Patton. So David W. Patton is Mormon, or was Mormon, and he was one of the like original leaders of the Mormon church. Now, not like a founding member, but he knew Joseph Smith. This is his story of what happened to him one day in Tennessee. I, I couldn't find a date for this, but... It, as I was riding along the road on my mule... I should put, like, Western music in this part. As I was riding along the road on my mule, I suddenly noticed a very strange personage walking beside me. His head was about even with my shoulders as I sat in my saddle. He wore no clothing but was covered with hair. His skin was very dark. I asked him where he dwelt, and he replied that he had no home, that he was a wanderer in the earth and traveled to and fro. He said he was a very miserable creature, that he had earnestly sought death during his sojourn upon the earth, that he could not die, and his mission was to destroy the souls of men. I, about this time he expressed himself thus, I rebuked him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by virtue of the holy priesthood and commanded him to go hence and he immediately departed from my sight. So that story, the reason why we know about that story was apparently he told that story to his buddy, Lycurgus Wilson. Lycurgus Wilson wrote a letter to another guy named Abraham Smoot. Abraham Smoot was writing a biography about David W. Patton in 1900. So the first time that this story came to light was in 1900. Now, Bigfoot sightings obviously had been around for a long time with the Native Americans. But even among Westerners, Bigfoot sightings were very, very, like, 1800s, like, early 1800s. So it would make sense that he would, they didn't, they didn't, every area had a different name for him. Like, in The Walking Dead, some people call them walkers, and other areas call them biters and stuff like that, because they wouldn't have national communication lines. You should watch The Walking Dead, by the way, it's really good. Anyways, so, this story, you know, again, this is coming from a... You know, a established member of the Mormon Church, one of the original guys. Now, and not, I mean, I'm using that term wrong, but he was he was highly, and he died a martyr for the Mormon cause. He was killed by he was killed trying to rescue Mormons who had been arrested, and they shot him like they had this charge, and he died. And he died, and Joseph Smith was like, "This dude was dope, and we should always remember him." So it's like this guy was OG Mormon. So he tells this story that he supposedly told this one guy, and then the guy wrote it. People were like, how do we take this? Now, the first thing that they do is they go, in the Mormon community, they go, okay, we really trust this guy. We trust this whole chain of people. He might have met Bigfoot. And Bigfoot may have been Cain. So the story of Cain and Abel, it's Bible class, guys. It's Bible class time. Cain and Abel were the sons of Adam and Eve, and Abel was like a really good worker, and Cain was like a total dick, never did anything, and he was really jealous of his brother. So one day he picks a rock up and just bashes his brains in, kills him. It's considered, it's not true, but some people consider it the first murder. Obviously there had been murders before that, we'll get into that in a second, but so he just bashes his brother's brain out, and God shows up. Like, voice in the sky, burning bush, however. He just is there. And he says, what have you done, dude? You're covered in your brother's blood. Your brother cries out from me from the ground. Which is creepy, actually. So do, like, corpses go, help, God, get me out of here. So then God says, now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth up to receive your brother's blood from your hand. 
When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. And then God says, Not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out of the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. There's been a lot of, you know, this particular passage has been, the whole Bible's been analyzed over and over again. The first question is, if Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel, but how does Cain go to a city? Like, he's headed out to Nod, and he ends up having a wife and having kids and stuff like that. And that's, again, always the pushback. The Bible is not a scientific textbook. It is not a genealogical tree of the entire planet. It is a religious history and a religious text of a particular people. So don't go to it looking for scientific questions. There were a ton of other people in the area, obviously, if Cain is able to leave and have a family and it not be his sister. That little rant aside, that's where they're getting this idea that he he has to wander the earth. Nobody can kill him. And the mark is the hairiness. And since he can't till the land, since the land is dead to him, how else would you feed yourself? You would just have to walk through the forest and like eat squirrels and stuff, eat berries. You could never be in any sort of industrialized society, one, be, especially back then, an agrarian society, because you, you'd be cursed to not have anything grow. Two, nowadays, people would be like, dude, that you're seven feet tall and you're hairy. Where are you supposed to work, McDonald's? I can't have you behind the counter. He might be able to work in a call center, depending on how he smells. David W. Patton had that encounter with whatever it was. Maybe he made it up, but let's assume that this actually happened. And like any thing, when something pops up that's kind of weird, there's two, generally the religion mainstream will take it one of two ways. They'll either go, that's a quaint story, but let's not get out of hand with that. And other people will say, you know, this guy is so high up in the church and he was well respected, we should give it some veracity. And the story was just kind of there for a while. There was something people would talk about as kind of a, a weird part of Mormon lore. Like, did David W. Patton really see Bigfoot? The, he's on a horse, and the guy's as tall as he is, and he's covered in hair. So years, years later, in 1969, the president of the church at that time was President Kimball. He wrote a book called The Miracle of Forgiveness, and he used that story in that book. So more than 100 years later, well, about 69 years later, actually. So 69 years later, he used that story, and he's the president. So the president of the Mormon church is basically the Mormon Pope. Like, they actually receive visions from God, and they can change certain laws. They can say, you know what, we're going to allow this. We're going to allow you to drink caffeine now. I just got a message from God, and he says, we can drink caffeine. Just got a message from God. We can start dancing. So they they are the, they're the ultimate prophet. They are a Latter-day Saint, in a way. I think they're all considered Latter-day Saints, but I mean, the prophet, he's like in charge. So him writing a book and using this story in it led a ton of renewed interest in it and credibility behind it. And when he uses that quote, he's basically saying this actually happened. So the common belief, unspoken, is in the Mormon church that Bigfoot is actually Cain. Almost like, and that would explain why you can't catch him, you can't kill him. He's doomed to wander the planet. So if we caught him, if we proved that it was him, then we just put him in a cage. That's His punishment is just to walk the earth until the end of time. So it would explain why we ha- can't catch him. Now, it doesn't explain why there are sometimes sightings of multiple Bigfoot, Big Fi, unless he ha- brought his family with him or he continues to have kids. But would they live forever? So next time you see a Mormon, you should ask him. Don't be rude. But just ask them if they've heard this story. And I, I, I can almost guarantee it's going to be 50-50. Some of them are going to be like, yeah, it's a fairy tale that, you know, we tell our kids. But I personally don't believe it. And they're most likely being honest. And then other ones will be like, oh, yeah, I've heard that before. I, I don't know whether or not I believe it, but I've, I have heard that story before. Every religion has wacky stories in it. The, I, when I was reading about this, there's, there's debate in 
there's debate that whether or not Bigfoot could exist at all based on biblical. I was going down the rabbit hole or the Bigfoot hole on this one. Could Bigfoot exist at all in biblical tradition? And one side says no. The flood would have wiped out Bigfoot. Like if he existed and if Cain was Bigfoot, that was one of the pushbacks. If Cain really was Bigfoot, the flood would have destroyed him. The flood would have killed Cain slash Bigfoot. That would have been the end of it. Other people think that it could be the leftover of the Nephilim, but the, since the point of the flood was to wipe them out, that's unlikely. Some people think this is post-flood. Some people think it's a dude. This is so funny. The Bible, again, just has the weirdest stories in it. So there's a dude. There was two sons. There was Jacob. Everyone's shutting the show off now. They're like, I don't want to hear your, your stupid Bible stories. This one's funny. So there's Jacob, and there's a dude named Isu. Might be saying that wrong, but just bear with me. So God's like, listen, you're going to have twins, but they're going to be separated. One of them is going to be super strong and take command. And most likely, the older will serve the younger one. So this woman gives birth. And trust me, this is Bigfoot related. This woman gives birth to Isu first, covered in hair. Absolutely covered in hair. And she's like, I will name you Isu, which (laughs) which means hairy. So she looks at the baby and goes, oh, man, you're covered in hair. Your name is Harry. Next baby she gives birth to is named Jacob. So they're brothers. And this is like the start of the genealogy of, again, like the Israelites, right? So they said, Jake, you know, one of them is going to help lead the people. And Isu was kind of like just hot headed, couldn't think of anything. One day he's out and they don't explain what happened. But he comes barreling into the house. And Jacob is eating some soup. Jacob's eating some lentil soup. Isu walks into the house half dead. No, like 75% dead. And he's like, oh, I need your soup. Oh my God, if I don't eat right now, I'm going to fall over and die. What he was doing previous to walking into the house, nobody knows. But he walks into the house and he's like, oh, give me some lentil soup. And Jacob goes, I will give you this soup if you give me your birthright. Because Isu was the oldest. He was supposed to be the one in charge. Jacob's sitting there with a bowl of hot lentil soup. And a man is starving to death. Doing what? Who knows what? Just 10 minutes previous. I will give you the soup if you give me leadership of the clan, basically. And Isu goes, at what point is leadership of a clan if I die of starvation right here? So Jacob gives him the soup. And takes over. What was what was he playing like Fortnite for like 10 days straight? How can you... We, there, there's multiple problems with that story. Just like moral problems. One, your brother's starving to death. And you're like, I'm just eating soup in front of him? And being like, oh, well, you know, if you give me that... Secondly, what were you doing that you were starving to death? You're in... You're like... Uh, what po- what a bizarre way to to jump into the middle of that story. It's not even that Isu... It says he came in from the open country. That's what we know. But was he just like out? I can imagine him with like sitting in the middle of nowhere with like a piece of wheat in his teeth like Huck Finn. And then going, oh my god, I'm going to starve to death. And he runs into the house and being like, please give me some soup. Because apparently they had soup. How far away? I don't know. So bizarre. Oh, and I want to say this too. There, there's a pushback also on Bigfoot being Cain because a lot for a, a lot of Mormons for a long time they don't think it so much, but for a long time they believed that the mark of Cain was you were black. So when everyone was white in the Garden of Eden and Cain kills Abel, they're already kicked out of the Garden of Eden. But so when Cain kills Abel, God goes, "You anything you do with the ground will produce no harvest, and you will wander the earth forever." And then he made him a black dude. That was a legitimate belief for a long, not not legitimate like it makes sense. But there was there was a belief for a long time. It wasn't until 1979 that the president of the church had a vision, and he goes, "You know what? God just told me black people." can be members of our church. Now, it's interesting to know, there were, I guess, a few before that, but now they could, like, rise up in the church. It is interesting to note that after he had that vision, they began doing a lot more missionary work in Africa. So it could have been a financial decision, could have been a message from God, I don't know. 
But so that's been the pushback because the Bigfoot that David W. Patton describes is both hairy and he was completely black. So you could take that as the skin being black or the hair being black. But yeah, there was a belief for a long time that black people were cursed by the mark of Cain, which makes it kind of complicated because they said, if you kill me, you'll suffer seven times over. And I don't think there's been much retribution for killing black people. A little bit, but not a lot. Not seven times worth. So that is the convoluted story of Cain, Isu, Bigfoot. Oh, oh, and I should say that, yeah, they thought Isu might be Bigfoot because he's covered in hair. But, you know, again... They, it was weird. Like the, they, people will, you know, if you're religious, you will go to your religious text and say, can you help me explain this stuff? And sometimes it can help you explain like moral dilemmas you have, but it's not going to tell you whether or not Bigfoot is real. That was a clip from our daily podcast, Dead Rabbit Radio. Dead Rabbit Radio is available anywhere that you listen to podcasts. It's daily paranormal, conspiracy, and true crime news. If you want to hear the full episode that this clip came from, check the link below. Please like and subscribe. And hit that little bell, too. That does some magical stuff. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.